heard about the importance of teacher training, and I am going to be nudging Minister Dick. Teacher training costs money, PVEC costs money, and and any time you are trying to transform the educational system, it will not be easy. You will meet resistance. It is, it is an upsetting of the status quo. Any change is an upsetting of the status quo. But education and training has three meshes systems. Huh? The curriculum. What is to be taught? People will fight over that. Some countries fight wars over that. The pedagogical issues, how it is to be taught, and how it is to be assessed. Especially, those are very powerful mediums, and when you try to change those in a country, you will meet resistance. So you have to look for the change levers. You will find change levers here, Minister. And you have to look for the advocates. I went to the ILO technical meeting in Panama that was about four years ago. And there was the Minister of Education who was the major leader and champion of transforming that educational system to meet the expansion of the Panama Canal. Otherwise, the Panamanians couldn't take the jobs. She was meeting with heavy crit criticism. People were saying, down with the minister. But there she was transforming that educational system, making sure that the youth get the training that they need so they could take the jobs benefiting from, benefiting from that expansion. In China, when they went to the world, the CIE can or the ACCC Congress in Beijing, there was the president saying that within five years they want to transform 20% of the academic universities in China to technical universities because China still has a large population that is underdeveloped. Plenty poor people in China, but they are preparing to take over the world. So there still is a lot of work to be done, and they were changing. It was almost 200 universities, from academic universities to technical universities to build their human resource capacity. So you need advocates. Find them and work with them. In every change, you will find people who will come with you. Those are the change levers. Then you have the fence sitters. Let, let me see here. You can get it done. And when you get it done, then they, stop aboard, they step aboard. And some won't come at all. Some will leave the system. I remember and Pauline, uh, Paulette could attest to this. When the CVQ issue was it, I am not a trained TVET person, but you can't talk no more TVET than me. Because I had the TVET subjects in CXE, but it was not, they were not high flyer subjects. People like the subjects with the big, the science subjects, the officers like the science subjects, and the subjects with a lot of injuries. The TVET subjects in CXE, small injuries, they don't want to shout about. Inside CXE, I took them. And I remember when it was sent to my first canton meeting. I said, boy, why you don't know nothing about this thing? I went to the internet, yeah? And pulled down some OECD, doc OECD documents and read and recognized that the move was to bring education and training close together. When I went to the canton meeting, I think it was at Knoxwood Court. You were there. And I gave my opening volley. They were surprised of this coming from. I didn't know that there was a difference of opinion with CXC. And I went back and challenged the system. I remember at one of the big meetings in CXC, somebody asked, why, why must we get involved in that type of education? We're an examining board. But it was well armed. I asked them, who took on transforming themselves in the UK? and offer the NVQ. It was the traditional examining boards. And we got on board. And now CXC is one of the major pushes of the CVQ in the school. You need your change levers. I don't know what is happening here. 
But in Barbados, they have no moved to retirement age to 67. Yes? You could have retired at 55 and get all your benefits. And uh, early and compulsory at 60. And the government moved it to 67. Now we have a case in court where uh, one of the statutory boards retires some people at 60 and they go on to the high court. So, at the same time, we have high unemployment, youth unemployment, and the raising the retirement age. Hmm? So we have to train the youth, but some of those people, people are not going to retire easy now. They are going to retrain. So there are two populations that you have, you have to deal with. So think about these things. So an integration in the Caribbean, TVET integration in the Caribbean, and the Caribbean Qualifications Framework developed by CARICOM. And we have one of the pioneers of CANTA, one of the pioneers of TVET. She also worked at CXC. I think I came about two or three years after you passed through. And uh, now a consultant, TVET consultant all over the Caribbean, the respected Dr. Paulette Dampier. Thank you so much, Eastman. I will, let me start off with this. I will not be with you for one hour. I'll be speaking to you briefly. I will just give you an overview as to what is happening with regard to the Caribbean Qualifications Framework, because I'm sure by now you are overloaded. Yeah? It must be. It's a, it has been a long day. So I'll be brief. I always start off my presentations with me, myself, which is not good. I went to a traditional high school, the academics. Fortunately for me, I had a principal who was into technical and vocational education and training. So in sixth form, uh, she told us, this is after CXCs, she told us each person must leave school. Her girls must leave school with a tech voc um, subject. And I chose typewriting and automech. We had to get our hands dirty at the time. That was years ago. Fortunately for me, when I went to the United States to study, I was able to use typewriting, and I was able to type all the theses and the presentations of the persons who, had, who were studying, especially those in the Middle East. They had money. And I charged five US dollars per page in 1981. Five US dollars per page to type the theses. Hello, I became rich. I would type night and day put their thesis out, and the persons would pay me in cash. From then on, I became a TVET person. So I transitioned from academia into TVET, because guess what? The dinero, the money. <laughs> Tax free. All right. So I'm a TVET person. I've been a TVET person ever since. Uh, and I wear two hats now. I work primarily for my own company, which is Dunpair Banting Associates. And I'm also the commissioner for TVET. That's an unpaid position, uh, which I gladly um, do. So I represent TVET, thanks to Eastman here, who nominated me as part of, the, of Cantor. He said he had to fight to get me on, <laughs> to get me there. But, um, so I'll just talk briefly on integrating TVET uh, into the for competitiveness. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the history, the strategy, which is important, the role of CANTA, CBET, competency-based education and training, and the qualifications framework, some current training initiatives, and some concluding remarks. Where are we today uh, is because of the education ministers way back in 1990 who agreed that TVET should be the vehicle to transform our economies. That was a long time ago. I can't even do the mathematics. So the first TV strategy was developed then, and it has since been revised. What is this strategy? It really is just a framework, a framework to coordinate, develop, and improve TVET. 
Before that, we have all different types of examining bodies, associations, offering TVET at different levels. So I would be doing TVET in one area, and somebody doing TVET in the same area, and we'd come up with two different outcomes. So the CARICOM ministers of education said, no, we will have to put a framework in place to help to coordinate TVET in the region. We have seen where for a modern society, we need a well-educated population. They have to be numerate and literate. They have to be highly skilled. They have to be well-trained. And we want, of course, for them to be internationally competitive. Worldwide, we've seen where people who have been successful, countries that have been successful, uh, we have seen where education is me measured in terms of the standards the learning outcomes and the competencies. And we have seen this over and over again. We had someone saying today that they really don't care if the persons come to us with the, with, the, with the skills and the knowledge or without the skills and the knowledge. They must have the correct attitude. So this is what competency-based education and training is about. Competency-based approach was agreed on by CARICOM as the way forward. What are some of the aspects? Uh, Dr. Monde spoke to some of them. Teacher training, development of curriculum materials, delivery materials, using competency-based education and training, quality assurance, occupational standards, improved training facilities, career guidance, and the development of that national or regional qualifications framework. So these are aspects of the TBED strategy that are currently in place. Now, how do we operationalize this? This is done through CANTA, the Caribbean Association of National Training. When I was there, it was national training um, agencies. It is now the Caribbean Association of National Training Authorities. And I do hope that Curacao will form part of that um, association. You're you're being invited to become part of CANTA. It was established in 2003, uh, and the founding members, Barbados TVET Council, Jamaica Heart Trust NTA, and Trinidad and Tobago. Since then, other countries have joined uh, and are on board, including CXC as a body, and fortunately, my company has also been um, accepted as a member of CANTA. So CANTA is that arm that will implement the TBED strategy across the region. Objectives, to promote a competitive regional workforce. We want to encourage and facilitate the free movement of persons across the region. Already, I think it was Eastman who spoke about um, persons from Guyana working in Barbados. And you see the movements up and down the Caribbean. Uh, Jamaicans are everywhere. They're in Antigua, they're in Barbados, they're in Curacao. I met one person last night who said he was from Jamaica, working in the hotel industry. So in order to, to um, facilitate the free movement, we want persons who are highly skilled, highly trained. And this is what CANTA helps to facilitate. That's the model that is used at CANTA. And don't worry, uh, Minister, I will leave this presentation with you. So you can share, that, share, share it with, with your, um, your um, principals. We begin always with the labor market. So we don't pull anything out of our hats to say, oh, maybe today we should do some psychology. Uh, maybe this is what um, our people need. We begin with the labor market. What it is that the industry requires? What it is that businesses require? Then we move into um, analyzing the occupation. We develop the standards. We de develop the qualifications. We assess our learners. And then we award the certification. So this is the model that is followed by uh, Cantor and CARICOM. So it's, it's standard driven, it's demand driven, and it is outcomes based. What it is that the learner should know on completion of that learning experience. Let me move on. Why CBET? Why have we gone this route? It really emphasizes the demonstration of competencies. Can I do? 
can you do? Show me how it is done based on the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes central to the occupation. Right? What are some of the principles of, of CBET? We focus on outcomes. We really don't care how the person comes into the institution. We really don't care. What is important is how they exit, right? So we focus on the outcomes. Uh, Dr. Dias spoke about that this morning. Um, we have had several examples of uh, um, Dr. Cornwell spoke about persons who were quote unquote outcasts, yet at the same time they were able to achieve um, their, their bachelors and, and doctorates, etc. It speaks to greater workforce or workplace relevance. Here I am being trained, but I'm being trained according to the industry standards. This is what they're asking for in the automotive industry. This is what they're asking for in agriculture. This is what they're asking for in the oil industry. So we begin with what industry requires. So there is greater workplace relevance. When you're finished with the training, you can go immediately to work the next day, virtually. We look at assessments as a judgment of competence. What does this mean? It means that we really don't care again how you're trained. At the end of the day, and Ms. Walker will speak to that, what we do is assess you on your competence based on measured against the, the, the standards. So if you're trained informally or you're trained formally, the emphasis is on your performance against the standards. We're looking at improved skills recognition. We recognize what you can do. And then we're looking at improved articulation. So there's horizontal movement, there's vertical movement in your framework. So let me just talk a little bit about the framework itself. Persons here have been talking about levels, level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. Another critical element of the strategy is developing your national qualification framework. I'm not sure if, she's curious, so have you gone into that as yet? Have you developed a qualification framework? Is one in place? More or less have something in place? Is there one? A qualifications framework? Right, so there is one here. I know in the Caribbean, the other regions in the Caribbean, um, Caribbean, we have two frameworks and they're both related. One is a regional vocational qualification which came off the bat a long time ago, 2003. And then there's a CARICOM qualifications framework and they're both linked. The framework really is just a tool. It classifies and registers all the qualifications that exist, yeah, based on standards. The important thing is that the qualifications are done based on standards that have been agreed on and are approved, approved in this case by Cantor and, and CARICOM. So they support mobility across the region because if I have a qualification that can be plotted on your, your, your framework, it means therefore that I can leave Barbados with a level two and work in Jamaica automatically without having to resit. Um, the qualification. So they aid in the understanding of qualifications where there is migration of labor across borders. So we really have some serious imperatives in the Caribbean. We're looking for improving the progression routes for persons in higher and further education. We want persons to be able to move from level one right up to the top. We're looking for qualifications that are modern and recognized. We're looking for qualifications that are internationally acceptable. Let me skip this one. We want to improve the quality of education and training, and the framework helps us to do that because there are certain requirements, and Ms. Walker will speak to uh, one or two of those in terms of the quality. Uh, we want to ensure uniform provision. So whatever is done in Barbados, is done in Curaçao, is do, done in Guyana, is done in Belize. There is consistency across the board. 
Uh, this is a framework. This was the first one that was done in, the, in CARICOM. This is the regional vocational qualification. And there are five levels. Probably this one explains it better. There are five levels. At level one, we have the entry level worker. Level two is your skilled worker. Level three is your technician. Level four is your master craftsman. And level five is your advanced professional or senior manager. There are five levels in the vocational qualification framework. Now, I always test this qualification um, framework, the vocational one. Uh, the Canadians recruit heavily at home, heavily. They come down and they want to add in the newspaper for um, truck drivers or they may want welders. But they don't ask for anything below a level two. They want level three and up, which is saying to me that for us to be internationally competitive, we have to put out graduates at the level three. That is where the, the international perspective comes in, a level three. They don't want an entry-level worker. They don't want a skilled worker per se. The, that skilled worker must come at least at the technician supervisor level for them to be internationally competitive. So when you're building your system, you're going to be looking beyond a level one, beyond a level two. And it takes time to get there, but guess what? We have to start, start at some point, right? Now, I spoke of the vocational. This is a CARICOM qualifications framework, and they map one into the other. If you notice, this one has 10 levels. It begins with a certificate, and it goes right up to the doctoral level, yeah? And it maps, maps onto the European qualifications framework as well and also maps onto the Commonwealth Transnational Qualifications Framework. And what we're finding now is that many countries in the Caribbean are developing their qualifications framework. Barbados was off the bat first and foremost. Uh, Belize, Jamaica, uh, St. Kitts, and St. Lucia will be moving into there shortly. All right, let me move. And there's a link between the national and the vocational because the framework recognizes that the primary, the secondary, vocational education and training, the tertiary sectors, all have links. They're all linked. So the framework connects and combines all the various sectors into one single national framework. So for this one, for example, in Jamaica, uh, if you notice on the right column, there is prior learning recognition, prior learning assessment and recognition. PLAR. Again, we can accommodate persons in the, who, in the informal sector who can present themselves, all the master craftsmen, etc., can present themselves to be assessed without having to go through a particular training program. Now, within the framework, we use the competency-based approach because we are concerned about what the learner knows, what he understands, and what he's able to do. So it's a knowledge, the skills, and the attitude um, coming out again. So by design, that qualification framework will consolidate the delivery of education and training, and it will make it easier for persons to enter and exit the system at any point in their life. So you're encouraging lifelong learning. And believe you me, I think I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, I hope I am. Uh, the other day, I, it is said that I have migrated. I have really migrated person. My children are in school. My husband is Canadian, so I guess um, I reside in Canada. But the other day, I had to pump my own gas, something I have never, ever done in my life. I had to go to the gas station, the petrol station, and, and nobody was paying me. The, exactly. I, I had to go and pay at the window. So I said to my husband, you have to teach me how to put gas into my vehicle. I've been driving for the past 30 years, 40 years. I never once had to put gas into my vehicle. So there was always somebody at the pump. Thank you very much. So there it was at my age, learning how to put gas in my vehicle. And I learned I was so proud the afternoon I had to post on my Facebook. 
lifelong learner, never too old to learn. So uh, this is what the framework does, right? It encourages lifelong learning. Otherwise, I would be sitting in that vehicle and not going anywhere, no gas. The framework then brings order, it brings structure to your education and the training system. It speaks to quality, it speaks to accessibility because you're widening access. And somebody asked me this morning, how do we accommodate special needs? This does. Your framework accommodates every single person in your country. Everybody. Those who are unskilled, the skilled, the professionals, you name it. They're accommodated under this qualification framework. So it supports quality in education because you're looking at accreditation, you're looking at um, audits, you're looking at monitoring, you're looking at evaluation. At the end of the day, you want a system that is not only internationally recognized, but the public will have confidence in the education and training programs offered by your institutions. All right, I'm skipping some of these. Now, this slide I think is important. If you're introducing TVET, CBET, CVQs, there are some requirements that are needed. You have to have, for example, or should have a very active national training agency or a TVET um, council or some TVET focal point. You need to have your labor market needs assessment because that will direct where your train is going. You will need your policies and your plans. Uh, I think Dr. Amande spoke to that as well. Dr. McLean spoke to that. You need your trained instructors. They have to be trained. You need relevant curricula, relevant standards that can be changed uh, based on the demand. You need your policies, your manuals, your trained assessors, verifiers, etc. You need a learning management system. You need facilities that can be audited and you should have some kind of risk management strategy in place. So these are some of the requirements of your system. You need training, and again, Dr. Monday spoke to the training that is required to uh, improve and to build capacity. Uh, this speaks to some of the work that we have been doing in the region, uh, meaning um, Don Pierre Bannon Associates. Uh, we've worked right across the region from Anguilla right down to Suriname. We, be, we end with S, eh? So it's Anguilla, Barbados, Belize, Dominica. Primarily train of assessors and verifiers, um, helping to establish accreditation councils, developing qualifications, framework, etc. Uh, we've also worked with TVET councils in Grenada, Guyana, St. Lucia, and St. Kitts, and the work is ongoing. Now, CARICOM has had some help. Uh, we have been uh, sponsored by CEFE. Several um, training interventions have been taking place through CANTA. Uh, they've conducted trainees assess assessment in all nine states. And I say nine because three have been left out. Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad and Tobago have not benefited per se under the direct um, training uh, of CEFE. They have concentrated, concentrated more on the developing and um, more established training agencies. And they have established partnerships with the larger Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> right, conducted training assessment, developed training manuals for competency-based education and training, uh, conducted assessments, uh, conducted facility audits, uh, conducted CBET training, trained competency-based education training curriculum writers, uh, and the train of trainers, developed learning management systems and they have also developed a national TV strategic plan for Suriname. So in concluding then, competency-based education and training is utilized in the regional vocational qualifications framework, and this is promoted under the CARICOM qualifications framework. It allows for a common approach. That is what is important, that common approach. So everybody's doing the same thing right across the region. It allows for articulation into higher levels, and what we know at the end of the day, 
the competency, the success is virtually guaranteed. It allows for the growth and development of competitive economies. And I'm going to leave you with a last slide. Critical or the CAL. These are critical success factors for your TVET, your CBET, your CBQs. You should have a suitable, what is suitable for Curacao? Your own developmental framework, which will fit into other frameworks. You should start with your orientation to competency standards, your labor market requirements, and I like this one, a personal commitment. Without the personal commitment, you're gonna have some falling out. And be realistic, yeah? Don't bite off big chunks. Start very small and gradually you will expand. Our heart was first off the bat in 1982. So we've had years of experience um, in, in TVET. So it, it has taken a while to get us to where we are today. Uh, simultaneous building of support systems, your curricula, your learning and your instructional materials. Teamwork. And Dr. Pinnock spoke of, of that this morning. Frequent consultations with industry. Monitoring, evaluation, pilot testing. I remember the first time I did, a, I started out as a measurement specialist because I worked with CXC. And the first um, assessment paper that I did for competency-based for CBET at heart, I can't forget to this day, the present, he's now the present chairman of, of, of heart took the paper that I had developed and ripped it up, put it in the garbage, and said, that is where your paper belongs. Couldn't cry in front of him. I had to go home, bawled my eyes out, went back, pulled up my socks, and said, let's start again. So it just means that I had to redo. So it's a matter of, of, of building on, on what you, you have. So we did a lot of trial, a lot of errors, but at the end of the day, um, I think we have a very successful system. Patience, stewardship, commitment, and the last one I love, big picture thinking and visioning. Think big, always think big. So this is your CARICOM qualifications framework. I did promise you that I was not going to speak for long. I'm going to be leaving the presentation with you for you to um, internalize and plan this new Thank you. Here you go. One of the experienced pioneers in TVET. Um, I think it was about 3.30 now, a little past. We're a little ahead of the game. We have time for a 15-minute break to, to start back, or you wish to keep going? Okay, good. Well, um, she touched on quite a few things. I am going to be touching on the policymakers again, Minister Dick, agitate, find people to agitate. Um, in some of the CARICOM countries between Trinidad and Barbados, there was a little dispute, not a physical dispute, but a little war of words. It was over flying fish because the Belgian fishermen go down to Trinidad when the fish migrate and they were really, the authorities were address, uh, arresting the Belgian fishermen. But it wasn't really flying fish. It was over oil. The government spent a lot of money to the international court to find a dividing line because there's 200 miles of sea separating Barbados and, and Trinidad. And I, I couldn't understand why. A Trinidad was saying that Barbados doesn't have a continental shelf, but the continental shelf stretching from Trinidad ends up 40 miles south of Barbados. So they were claiming up to 40 miles. And we spent a lot of money, the two countries spent a lot of money going to the court, only to be told that it's a midway dividing line 100 miles out from each country. And there, Barbados had already had a set of oil blocks because the, on the structure of Barbados suggests there's offshore oil around Barbados. And the same company in Trinidad, one of the same companies running Trinidad, 
oil came up and immediately bought two or three blocks. Yes? I'm talking about agitation. And I went to a meeting with the Ministry of Energy. And anybody know in the Caribbean know about Isma, Isma make noise. Agitate. And they had a plan for training to meet the pending oil industry. And you know what? They allocated 100,000 US dollars. This is what the company had to put down for buying one of the blocks to train two geologists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, 100 US dollars to train two geologists. And no money was allocated to all the welders and the people providing the transport. Where most of the jobs are going to come on the oil platform. Made noise. They went back to the drawing board. So you have to have people to agitate. She touched a bit on the standard, the level three technical standard. We were trying to get some people exported to take up the many jobs in Canada. And I, I think the Jamaicans would know about the Red Seal program. And when we checked the community college, the program was too theoretical. When we checked the Samuel Jackman Prescott, it was practical but not theoretical enough. And when we checked the apprentice program, that was practical but not theoretically enough. So you had three major institutions in Barbados, none producing a candidate that can challenge the Red Seal program. It had to be a combination of the community college graduate and the, and the Samuel Jackman. So you see where we are.